Welcome to the New Testament Church service this morning. My name is Duncan. I'm an elder here, and I'm going to share a little uh, impression that I got during the week. Um, I don't know if you guys have watched that new show, but they've got this show where it's uh, like, like a jangle thing, and you pick things out of it to see if it'll stand or not. And if you pick the wrong thing out, it collapses. Well, I was thinking about Paul's message last week, and I thought that it was very good. It very, very, very clearly demonstrated the intensity of the, uh, the battle that we're in between our, our mind and our enemy. There are thoughts coming against us on a daily basis. So I saw more clearly the intensity of the battle, every thought. Imagine if we could bring every thought into captivity and examine it in the light of God's word. There seems to me to be so much that goes through my mind, unexamined, like on autopilot, and before I know it, I'm accepting things without knowing their foundation. We can to make these, tend to make these decisions align. Whoops, I got the wrong line. I want to make sure that these things align with God's will. I find myself becoming angry with different groups and self-righteous and supportive of others without really knowing how I got there, operating what sometimes turns out to be a false premise. Someone recently said we can make an average of 35,000 35, decisions in a day. Shouldn't we do everything we can to align with God's will? If we persevere in our study of the Bible and partake of the wisdom found there, I believe that most decisions will be made in the light of his word. We will, by our diligence in the word, have a built-in filter. We need to repair the walls of our minds. I don't know about you, but there's so much coming at us every day. Uh, different premises, different policies, different principles. And without the light of God's word, it's very easy, at least for me, to get sidetracked and to get very passionate about things that are on a shaky foundation. So I need to be um, consistent in my activity as far as being in the word goes, because that will straighten me out. I mean, I recently listened to a tape that Chuck Lindbergh sent me. And it was full of new ideas that I won't go into, but they made sense, you know, and they challenged the status quo. And I want to be open to what the Holy Spirit would do. So I hope that when we have uh, the word today, that it will empower you, that it will edify you, and that we will all do things that will edify our walk with Christ. Why don't we stand as I lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to come together and to worship and to be together and to fellowship, Lord. I pray that all things would work together for our good through your grace and your power. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Amen. Glory to God, how far, how long? And how long is forever? Forever. Amen. You may be seated. Um, We are going to be partaking of communion together as I um, read a couple of portions of Scripture. Communion is that time in the church's life that we ponder for a moment. We think, we ask God to reveal to us specific things, as he says in his word. It's a time to stop and ponder for just a moment, examine our own conscience. It says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now, in this passage, it goes on to warn us about taking it unworthily. I want you to think for a moment. Jesus himself came to the disciples and he took bread and he broke it. And it was not a loaf of bread like you might have at home. It was a flat piece. It was unleavened. And he broke it, a symbol of no sin. And he broke it. He knew around that table that every disciple would forsake him. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that Jesus, uh, Judas would betray him directly, but he knew the others would flee. And yet he still said this. Why? Because he was saying, I will hold no grudge against any of you that do what you're going to do, and because I'm, my body is broken. You know, this is a beauty. When we take of com- partake of communion, we are partaking of this tiny wafer that's a symbol of this, unleavened bread, and we're saying, Lord, your brokenness in the cross shows me the way that even though I may have relationships that appear to be broken, the answer is not for them to break further, but for me to break. And say, God, what should I do to help in the healing of this relationship? So before we partake, we all examine our conscience and say, Lord Jesus, we ask you, Lord, that if there's any thing that needs to be reconciled between ourselves and someone else the Lord if we take this we are saying before you that we will do everything we can to make it a priority to make those things right before you Lord so God we thank you for your brokenness and we thank you that you break us that we might come into right relationship with you and one another in Jesus name let's partake We make it difficult to take communion here because it's tough to get the top off of this. But he said this, he said, listen, the cup is the New Testament in my blood. Now, you may know this, that there were five different times the cup was passed at that Last Supper, not just one. And it all had symbolic meaning for the covenant God had with us and particularly this. You know, when someone puts a... um, an objective, a standard of perfection on you, or someone puts that and you just say, you, isn't, it's, it's amazing, you just say, I, I just can't measure up. If you feel like you can't measure up to God, that's true. All nod and say, I can't measure up to God. I, there's no way in my strength I can keep all his commandments. That's right, we can't do that. But here's the beauty of the cup. 
The cup reminds us constantly, whatever God requires, God supplies the strength to do it. And you say, yes, God supplies the strength, right? Through His blood. That His blood, the life is in the blood. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to keep that which He has committed unto us and that we've committed unto Him. So Lord, we come to you right now and we thank you that our sins are forgiven. As we've repented before you, we are clean before you because of what you've done, not because of what we've done. We thank you for that power, Lord, to live the Christian life. And so we thank you, God, for your shed blood, for your forgiveness on the cross, and the power to live the Christian life. In Jesus' name, let's partake. Amen, amen. It's great. Isn't it good to remind ourselves of these things? Amen? All right, we're starting in 2 Corinthians 10. So if you all stand together for the Word of God, these are three short passages. They have one or two verses in each one. And um, we'll read it together with Dave Bowman. All right. Well, I don't have one to look at back here, so... I'm going to look at this one with you this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Amen. God's word Main for his standing, church. We're going to sing part of that first verse. And so um, you don't know it probably, but you'll learn it very easily from here. And I'll, I'll just go through it a couple times. It'll make it simple. Because sometimes singing the word helps you remember. I do want you to remember what I say, but singing can help. Here's how it goes. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty. Yes, they are mighty. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through the Holy Ghost. For they are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty, yes, they are mighty. Oh, they are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty through the Holy Ghost. Oh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty, yes, they are mighty. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through the Holy Ghost. For they are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty. Yes, they are mighty. Oh, they are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty to the Holy Ghost. One more time. Oh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty. Yes, they are mighty. Oh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through the Holy Ghost. For they are strong to the pulling down of strongholds. They are mighty. 
seated. Occasionally I will get the cobwebs off the accordion. And I forgot the word. Don't forget the word. Or what it says. So we're going to frame, I'm going to frame my remarks around these three passages. I'll highlight them as we take a look at it. Now, we've been talking about persecution. We talked about the fact that the first time we met, I was online, but we talked about the fact that a synonym of persecution is pressure against your faith. In other words, sometimes when you first come to Jesus and you get to know Jesus and you're just amazed that someone loves you like Jesus... You wonder why everybody doesn't come to Jesus. You say, why not? If I just present Jesus, everybody's going to get saved immediately. Not really. In fact, there's an enemy of our souls, and he comes spiritually to attack us, but he doesn't have the power to do so directly. He does it through the flesh, through people's flesh. Through That means there's a sin nature inside of you that is also upset at your profession of faith. We looked at that last week, where the pressure is within. So persecution is unrelenting, unremitting pressure against what you believe. That's different than a trial. A trial's come, they go. uh, We thank God when a trial ends. We're not quite sure whether we're to rejoice that it ended or to prepare for the next one, but we do know that we go through trials. That's a normal thing. Just nod your head. It's a normal thing. The Bible says do not think it's strange to go through trials. But persecution can be unrelenting because it's internal as well as external, and it's pressure against the faith. And we talked about this last week, but let me repeat it. Jesus said, if they have persecuted me, they will persecute you. He said the following, remember, it is not against you, it is against Christ in you. It's important, otherwise you pick up personal offenses. Can you believe they mocked me? Can you believe they wrote an article about me? Can you believe they, 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 uh, they twisted what I said out of context? That's standard procedure. Can you believe that that happened? I can't believe that someone would say that. I can't believe a friend would actually say that when they said that they were my friend or I've been a friend for years. The Bible said that's all human, that we're all going to go through that. But the critical thing to recognize is, ultimately, the reason we can say, Lord, forgive them, they know not what to do. The reason we can say, Lord, forgive them, I don't hold it personally against them in the power of God is the only way you can do that is because the real persecution is not against us. It really is about Christ. If we were just nice people who can go along and get along, and everything would be fine. I remember someone saying to me, said, you Christians are the real problem with what we need to do for everyone to get along. I said, why? I would love to get along. Well, yeah, but would you agree to go along with everything that we decide? No, I can't agree to that because I know there will be things that will cross convictions. See, why do you have to have convictions? Why can't you just have preferences that you can negotiate away at any point? And I've said to one person, I said, you know what? You actually should be thanking me, not just me personally, but Christians for having convictions, or you wouldn't have the freedom to oppose me. Because if you lived in a society that granted no freedom for opposing viewpoints, and there are plenty out there to choose from, you'd find out that it would be illegal for you to do what you're doing. See, you and I need to recognize this. So now we come to a little bit more advanced. We're going to talk about this as the assault on truth. See, not only do we have a war within, but there's an assault in our culture that is gaining ground because the checks and balances against that assault have been removed. 
So now, God by design is allowing those to be removed because through persecution and an assault on truth, people's eyes are opened because all of a sudden they realize, oh, they're against all absolutes? I didn't know that. I didn't know they were against all rule of law. Only when it is, uh, wow, I didn't realize that. See, that's why more people came to Christ at the place of martyrdom in the ancient world than ever came to Christ through evangelism. Why? Because all of a sudden they said, that man, that man was only kind to me, that man expressed only love to me, and the government put him to death just because they're threatened that he has a different opinion? Something is wrong here. And they inquire, and they become a Christian. It's happened over and over again. So the assault on truth, and yet... I don't want to be technical today, but I want to be as practical as possible. I want to first talk about the Old Testament word for mind. Because it's our minds that are assaulted because our minds have landed on certain presuppositions, we might call them premises, assumptions of truth. See, the beautiful thing when Jesus says, I am the truth, he is the truth at all times, in all places, for all cultures, in every situation. I expressed it one time to someone having a discussion. He's a multicultural truth absolute. (laughs) Multicultures in all periods. You can't say something is true in all cultures at all times. Yes, because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now this is where the rub comes. And you and I have not experienced much of this in our life now, but now the gates are opening up. And there will be this aspect of it. Now, the word meditation, translated meditation in the Old Testament, is a Hebrew word, siyak. It means to converse with oneself. Now think, the definition actually means that your mind is designed to have conversations with itself. So don't think you're crazy. This can get out of hand, though. How many know what I mean? But you're designed to converse with yourself. You're designed to think about that thought again that you just heard in your mind and go over it again. Now, Now, listen, there are two ways that the Bible is telling us we have to fight this battle. And the first is distraction because, I don't know about you, but your mind can race constantly and go from one topic to another and pretty soon, now, now, we... I can blame it on my age. I can be sitting in the living room and think, you know what? That's something I need to do right now. And I go up the stairs. By the time I get to the top of the stairs, I've had seven other thoughts of things that need to be done. And then finally, and if I happen to say it to Charlene, then finally she says, oh, did you do the thing you were... That's the one thing I didn't do. I thought of six other things going up the stairs. And then I just said, I was going to blame it on my age, but then, you know, someone like Greg Cashmania is going to say, oh, wait till you become old. <laughs> you don't even have a clue about it. So you can't get away with that. So the point is, you'll look, you'll look at this and you'll say, God, I have to be very careful because focus, how many would admit, focus is a problem. It's a challenge. And the enemy gets in there and our minds are all, oh, the play, up, oh, up. Oh. How do we pay attention? We're going to talk about that. But the idea is the mind does this. Now, there's another word for teaching and learning akin to the mind. In Hebrew, in in English, it's called lamad. Lamad means to cut a canal. In other words, to dig. There's no canal there. It's just all woods and just, just land. And it's to cut and to make a canal. Why would that be? Because a canal prepares for a river. And the canal means you start to think according to presuppositions. There are borders. A canal is not a canal unless there are banks. You with me? There are limits. See, we have to realize it's limited. We have to learn to limit our minds to the focus that God is giving us because we're going to be assaulted. And the point is that's why we have those banks to the river that guide it. 
the actual Hebrew word presupposes, or let's say foreshadows, the Greek word for the mind, which is channel of intellect. Notice, to cut a canal or a channel in the Old Testament, the Old Testament picture, the new is in the old contained, the old is by the new explained. So to cut the canal, which means that doesn't, that, that's, that's not something that we look forward to, cutting. That's what we, was like cutting a covenant, cutting a canal. In the New Testament, it's very clear that the Holy Spirit, it's the spirit of our minds. The Holy Spirit inside of us wants to use a consistent mind to have the river flow in. Now, thank God, all of our thought patterns aren't biblical. We have that, and, and th how many would love to see and are thankful that God floods the field? In spite of our thought patterns. He does that occasionally. But it's the thought patterns. So what do I mean by a thought pattern? See, when you get into the Greek and the Hebrew words for mind, a thought pattern means a presupposition. You, you hold to an assumption that you know is true. It's those assumptions that were, are under attack. We have to rehearse those assumptions. Because they didn't come by our own reasoning. They came by the power of regeneration in the Holy Spirit. They didn't just come because we thought they were nice assumptions. We never would have thought of those assumptions if had it not been for God himself. You can't reason your way into the kingdom. You don't go to God and say, look how smart I am. Don't you want me on your team? You know, that's not the way it works. God comes after you before you ever do that. I mean, Bob Mumford used to say it so well. He said, Holy Spirit chases you down, takes his time, eight years, pins you to the floor. Finally, you look up and say, oh God, I found you. It's the Holy Spirit that was hunting you down the whole time. And this is, this is the way it is. We, we don't realize this at times, but we realize these assumptions, and I'm just going to give you a few examples today, that's what's under attack. See, the scriptures say we don't war carnally. We don't go to war with carnal weapons. We don't go to war with just logic and just thoughts and, and just say, well, I'm just going to give you my assumption and that's the way it is, and, and that assumption alone will chase you out of your castle. No. The, in fact, the Bible makes this clear. I'll just unpack this. It says this. We don't war against the flesh. We don't war with prideful logic. We don't say, I've got to know everything about everything. I've got to read every book that ever was written on the subject so I has crammed in my head. So anyone, anything someone says against me, you can tell I've been there. I will have an answer. No. That's not possible, and neither is it wise. In fact, it says this. It's strong. The Holy Spirit is strong in us as we renew our minds. See, you're not transformed into his image by the removal of your mind. It's, it's the renewal of your mind. I remember one of the first books I ever read as a Christian, uh, not the first, but uh, among the first four or five, when uh, my father would start feeding me these books, and I, and I would get there, and it said this terrible paragraph. I went to him, and he says, no, that, that's not right, and that was good, and that was this. Best way to walk in the Spirit is take your mind and blow it to the moon. No. It's to offer your mind a living sacrifice unto God and let him renew it. Because it's the spirit of the mind, Ephesians says, that we're transformed in. Not, it's not the mind's not the problem. The problem is we're not often having it renewed by biblical assumptions, biblical principles, and biblical thoughts. See, it's the pulling down of fortresses that are needed. A fortress is a castle. In the Greek, when it talks about 2 Corinthians 10, pulling down those fortresses, we're facing fortresses and assaults on truth from the upper windows of fortresses. The Bible makes it very clear that when someone's in contention and anger and assaulting that which is true, they're like the bars of a castle. They cling to it. And they're shooting down at our assumptions. And the Bible says, then what you need to do is you cast down every argument. That's a different Greek word. The word argument means that you, you're looking at the fact that there are premises. An argument starts with a premise, starts with something that's true. Now, all of us should be aware of this premise. In the beginning, God. Okay, that's the biggest premise. There is a God who was in the beginning, so he's before me, before you, before anything. God is the creator. He is sovereign. He is over all. There is a God. Now, in America, it's never been a big deal to say there is a God. Well, it's getting to be a big deal now. Because if you say there's a God, all of a sudden there's an inference in that. Wait a minute. 
if there's a God, is this, does this God ever make any demands? Yeah. By his very nature, if he's God, he sets the rules. Oh, whoa. You said the word rule. God doesn't set rules. And there is a theory growing up under the banner of Christianity. It is not Christianity. It is heresy. But it is growing up under the banner that God has suggestions. And his suggestions are, are there, but they're not rules. So you are led by the Holy Spirit. You do not have to have that checked by anybody. You're led by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit causes you, if this is in writing, I can document it, by Christians. If the Holy Spirit leads you to break one of the Ten Commandments, go with the Holy Spirit and not with legalism. But I say to you, if it violates the Word, it's not the Holy Spirit. It's the Word that rules. Because the Word is God. And therefore, when you look at those things, you realize, wow, that's a massive assumption that there is a God. That's fairly simple, but the inferences are becoming very clear. See, you and I need to realize, there's going to be an assault because if there is a God, then there are rules. That No wonder the communist dictator and Lenin and Stalin and at the beginning of the Soviet communism in the early 1900s made it clear, if there is no God, all things are permissible. Because they knew that they had to get rid of God in people's minds if everything was going to be permissible. Because there is a God, not all things are permissible. But... I digress a little bit because I, I, want, I want to be as clear as I can, but that's the casting down of an argument. We cast down false arguments, just like the assault is on our assumption that there is a God, there's also false arguments that come against us, and they come in their conclusions. See, the whole castle is the conclusion. Uh, the Bible calls a gate. The gates of the enemy. The gates there. The, the castle is the conclusion. So what do you do when the conclusion accuses you well, then you must hate people. No, that's not true. Well, according to my worldview, which the, wish they would say that, but that isn't always the case. You see, false assumptions and worldviews are often hidden. They're not brought out. Like, for instance, today, I would say that if today in our culture people would actually show their premise and what they really believe, there are more people that would be so shocked they would react against it. So it's better to hide it and not say that. And the, the point is, you and I need to recognize that God is going to be teaching us. You don't have to become a logician. That's not a magician. A logician is an actual word that learning the rules of logic. You don't have to know everything about logic and memorize every fallacy. It's helpful. But you don't have to do that. Okay? You have to recognize that with this, the New Testament word means seat of reflective consciousness, and it means a channel of deep thought. Dianoia. Dia meaning channel, noia meaning thought. So you have this idea of the channel of thinking. See, if there is a God, it produces a string of thoughts that work together. This is what a thought pattern is. See, if there is a God, then there are rules. I should know them. How do I please God if there is a God and a creator? Because that will bring me the greatest happiness if there is a God. And therefore, all those thoughts, how do you, how many know, see what I'm saying? They're strung together. They're very naturally, they're a thought pattern. They're a canal. And if you get it biblically, the Holy Spirit comes rushing right through that canal and feeds you and gives you life. And the trees grow on both sides of the river and, and we have all this kind of fruit. But when the canal's in the opposite direction, you can be a Christian and your mind is secularly molded. You're thinking a completely different assumption. But you're saying there is a God. A recent test that took place, recent meaning 10 years ago or more, 
they took a test from the average believer. George Barna, who is this pollster, a very solid Christian, and I uh, have, have finally had a chance to meet him at, at a seminar and was able to talk to him a little bit and recognize, man, his intents are, are really good, and he tries to do this very, very accurately, and he said this was the, this was the result of the seminar, that the average person who says they're a Christian in America particularly will say that there is a God, that the Bible is the Word of God, but then in the survey they also say there are no absolutes and that everyone, everything must be negotiated based on the situation. So George Barner says, what do we call that? You can call it schizophrenia, you can call it all kinds of things, but the problem is the assumption that the Christian says is not how they're thinking. That's why we have the mess that we're in. So we don't think it through. So now you have this idea of a thought pattern. You have blockades, you have all kinds of things, and, and therefore the, the river gets flooded. But there are people who will take what the Holy Spirit does and twist it in another direction because their worldview is different. See, you and I, a worldview is not just a light matter. It's huge, because it's how we live. And it's not the problem that we have too few people professing Christ in America. We have too few people living like their profession. That's the problem we have. So every high thing against the thoughts of Christ, it says, that means that every high thing means the Bible applies to every area of life. There's nothing it doesn't apply to. Now, when I say that, there are people in seminars, I've just been in two seminars, and they'll start asking questions. And they didn't ask all these, but it's a very practical question. You're not going to tell me, you said you like hockey. Yes. You said you played hockey. Not well, but yes. I didn't want to get boxed in the core, you know. And you said you even, you even knew all the stats for the Boston Bruins. Well, that's accurate. That's true. In the 70s. I did do that, and that's true. I like playing hockey. You can't tell me that the Bible has anything to do with playing hockey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I may tell you how I played before I became a Christian. At six foot five, I wanted to hit and be hit. I liked the hitting. I didn't care if the puck went in the net because I was an angry guy. I was very, I finally found my niche in life. It was tough to move me from the front of the net. I didn't know how to, I had no finesse. But I was big. And I wanted to get bigger. And I wanted to be able to, because I could punish, I didn't care what it was. No, it, it was not good. After I became a Christian, yes, you can still check in hockey when you're a Christian. But the point is, you're limited. You now have a different motive. Thank God the Bible applies to the ethics in sports. Here's a digression. No charge for this. Just a little detour. Do you know that the history of athletics worldwide, whenever it, an athletic sport came from another country into America, it got taken through a grid of Christian ethics and the rules changed. That's what happened. And when games were invented in America, the rules, were, it was the rule of law. That's not the way it was. You often in athletic sports, you can check it out. Check me out. Go back through the ancient world. You played till the other team was dead. There were no rules. It was total chaos. But then it comes to America because of its Christian history, and it goes through the sifting of the rule of law. I recently read an article, I know I'm crazy, I understand it, I'm very strange. I read an article on the origin of the rule of law in football and what's happening today, contrasting to modern day and what was done in the early 20s and 30s with football. What am I reading an article about footballs in the 20s and 30s? Because it's talking about the application of what would be a Christian ethic even to sports. Folks, it applies to every area of life. There's no area of life. Otherwise, we then leave that area of life free to be assaulted and just taken over. It's not true. In our minds, it applies everywhere. So what does it mean that we're transformed by the renewing of the mind? What, is, what does that mean? And I'm going to give you some practical examples here. The renewing of the mind literally is talking about a three things. There are three verbs in related scriptures that deal with this. Reflection is the first. It means to reflectively ponder, to go back on itself. You know, the Old Testament word for mind is a word used for a cow chewing its cud. I didn't call you a cow. 
I simply said the word itself means to turn back and forth on the same thing until it's digested. For a cow, they send it to one stomach, then it comes back up, send it to another stomach. So it is for the Christian. We ponder a verse of Scripture. If you have devotions, all of a sudden, it, does it ever happen that the verse jumps off the page? Somehow it's gripping you, and you ponder it. Now try writing it out. Now, now think about it all day long, and you find out that it is, it is, you're digging it in. You're, in, you're digesting the word because it's spiritual, not just intellectual. And therefore, it becomes part of you. This is what the scripture talks about, about, about reflection. It's meditation. It's in the New Testament. It's focusing. Well, let's talk about distractions for just a moment. So my problem of going up the stairs. I'll pick on me. Here's the problem. When I got up, I had a certain intent. What I didn't do was exercise a discipline of focusing on that area. Limit my thinking. It's limited. I, I like to think with many thoughts. I, I like to have nine tasks suspended in limbo as I try to get them done. Problem is, later in life, I don't get as many multitasks done as I used to. It's better to focus, but it's always better to focus. So you need to look at that and the limit, and you still repeat it. You repeat it in your mind. All right, I'm going outside right, right now to the shed for something that Charlene needs. So I can sing about going to the shed. I can talk about going. I'm really not this bad. But I think for illustration, it's very important. And I end up at the shed. <laughs> I come right back, give it to Charlene. She goes, wow, <laughs> this is amazing. And, and, or, or I'm halfway to the shed and she's calling me. <laughs> Do you remember you're going to the shed? Anyway, the point is, <laughs> this is the way it is. You know, we have a wonderful relationship. The point is this. We do help each other out. It works both ways, occasionally. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, you and I need to recognize there are limits. We have to learn. It's a discipline. Yes, everyone fights different things. And there are people based on all kinds of things, the way God made us. We all have defects in our minds and our character. We're all different. Uh, it's harder for some than to others. But the same principle works to solve it. And that is to focus, to put a limit on other things. To put down the other thoughts of, me, of what I'm going to do this afternoon at 3 o'clock when, when it's 11 in the morning. I've got that down. I can write it down. Now listen, this really helps. To, to have a diary, to have a notebook, to write down the things that you need to do. It's very important. It's not just important because you might forget. It's important to put it in priorities and to make sure you get one thing done before the next. This is, uh, this is not a psychology class. This is a biblical method the Bible tells us. That's what it means to renew the mind. It means to limit the mind. So we know that. And creative expression, the spirit of the mind, we, can, we, we do it. We rehearse it. Rehearse Bible verses. Sing Bible verses. Go over and over again, reflectively, back and forth, and then creatively express it. Uh, one of the things my, the pastor that discipled me, the Methodist pastor near the campus where after I became a Christian, he took me through several books and, and, and things to ground me in Christ. Now, I look back on that as phenomenal. Not every student in college has a pastor who tutors them, who, who grounds them. I had that. I didn't know how special it was then. But one of the things he would have me do is to write it out. He said, okay, you had five scriptures to memorize this week. I'm meeting with you five o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday before the evening service. And, and he had me be part of the evening service. I didn't like speaking in public. I was too afraid. I was afraid of my shadow. I was very, very different then. <laughs> Charlene says, what did he do? You haven't stopped talking since. Anyway, the point is, when, when that happened, and now he's gotten, and now I sit down, he says, okay, what was you, I, I had you write the verse out in your own words as what it means to you. Now I have to apply it. That's deeper than just memorizing. I was learning to do that. That's what the scriptures are talking about. Because if we grow in the Lord, you're going to spot the false arguments far quicker. You're going to be able to spot them in discernment, spiritually, even before you can understand them intellectually. You'll be able to see something's wrong with this. There's something wrong, and what's hidden is this hidden um, assumption that isn't being revealed. And of course, the application of that, renewing the mind, reflecting on it, creatively expressing it, and applying it to the area in which you're uh, dealing. See, the Bible applies directly to many things because many issues in life are in the Bible. 
But the Bible always applies indirectly from principles to that area as well. So we can have a biblical worldview, and that leads to a biblical life and a consistency or a greater consistency. Well, I don't have to tell you that 1 Peter 3.15 talks about this, that we're in a war. There's an assault. And it says this, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That's where it begins. Lord, I want to be sanctified in my heart. I want my heart to be with you. I want my motivation to be with you. You know, when I first learned how to debate, I became worse than I ever was because I didn't think I had a brain when I was in college. Now, I nearly flunked out of high school, and, um, and they actually they had a, one of the professors had this idea that I heard him say to my father that I was like the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz. Now, he didn't have to finish it because I'd seen The Wizard of Oz. And I knew that that guy had no brain. Um, The teachers in my high school said, I have no brain. They were right. (laughs) I did not, I couldn't think. I didn't pass in homework. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. And so there was a problem there. Well, now I realized it wasn't because I had no brain. It's because I wasn't using it properly. And I recognized that. and, And there was this, the idea of sanctify the Lord, because when I learned a little bit of logic, I couldn't, it was like, now who can I debate today? A good day were five good arguments. And anyone who disagreed with me was game. Let me practice. If I get hit, okay, I've got to go back and practice some more. That's not the point. The Bible's clear. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. This is a motive. You need, you and I need to recognize how we're going to discern the assault on truth, which is the assault on the assumptions. Let me give you three examples that are prevalent in our society today. It says here, when it says a reason, the Greek word in 1 Peter 3.15 is apologia, from which we get apologetics, which is a whole study of Christianity and defending the faith, but all not giving an apology. It's the original word for apologetics, which simply means to defend. But, but beyond that, here's a, here's a case. For instance, one of the fallacies we always teach is loaded question. One of the issues of a loaded question is to hide the accusation. And uh, it's kind of clear. So, for instance, someone come up to me and say, Dr. Jaley, Reverend Jaley, I have this idea in my mind. Are you one of those people that you believe in God? Yes, I, I believe in God. You believe the Bible? is like authoritative yes yes i do i that is so backwards that is so not modern that is so out of sync with today's there are no absolutes and there's no god and the bible is an ancient book that no one can make any sense of and you are you are dealing with that that that's absolutely crazy now so hidden in that loaded yes there's an assault on the existence of god But there's an accusation that I am a fool for believing in absolutes. He didn't say that. I'm accusing you. And the second thing he didn't say, which I usually, best way to start someone assaults the truth is always very nicely with completely the opposite spirit ask a question on the accusation. This is what Jesus did. In this situation, and I've been in that situation I'm describing, I've simply said this, well, What alternative source of absolute would you suggest? (laughs) Anything but the Bible. Oh, anything but the Bible. Are you talking about another religious book? Is there another religious book you'd like to replace with the Bible? No. I don't want any religious book. Well, is there any authority? No, there's no no authority. So there's no authority. Well, what I'm hearing you say is you're the authority. So in other words, you're what you think is absolute, and so therefore you're, you're assaulting my absolutes with your absolutes. So literally, let's just have a civil discussion here, because you really do believe in absolutes. You are the absolute. Now, it's not always wise the first time you meet someone to brought to that conclusion. I'm just simply saying, I'm just, this is a mess, I'm just trying to be succinct. And it's not good to be angry like I used to be and desire, oh, here's like another idea I can assault like I played hockey. (laughs) No, it's 
What do you suggest? All of a sudden, the individual realized something that they didn't realize. They were unconsciously assaulting with the assumption they were the absolute. And I said, how could a society run if each individual is absolute? Who would ever get along with anyone? And then he started going off on all these kind of stuff. But the thing is, you and I, we're not trying to win every argument. We're not trying to be, but you have to recognize this. The ultimate goal is when there is a God, the God of the Bible, he's transcendent. Or someone may say this today, oh, you believe in the Bible. I believe in science. I said, what's your definition of science? Because you know, no, I don't know what your definition of science. I know my definition, but that's not the question. What's your definition of science? Well, science is, you know when things are proven. How are they proven? Well, they're proven because you, you get a consensus. Oh, good. Okay, you get a consensus of people. Yes, like, and then they give me an example. Like this has been proven. I said, well, okay, I beg to differ with you because that was only pro proven because the scientists you're alluding to ruled out all differing opinions, put them in jail, and shut them up just so they could have consensus. That's not consensus. Would you agree? <laughs> so what is science? The idea would be to question. So here's the bottom line, folks. When the assault comes, and you will have it come, you'll have it different than me, different creative expression, God has creative ways. But the point is, when it does, do not forget that the person or the institution or the government that assaults has its own assumptions. Often they are either not self-conscious about or deliberately hiding. And if the real assumption came out, people would be shocked. Oh, here's another one. We, we look at, um, well, if, my gosh, Dr. Chile, if you don't think the civil government ought to be in control of everything, no, I don't believe the civil government ought to be in control, control of everything, uh, because you criticize the fact that whenever there's a problem in society, everybody wants the government to solve it. I said, yeah, I'm critical of that. That's true. You, got, you read me right. <laughs> That's good. Hey, let's shake hands on that. We understand each other. No, I, well, the only other alternative is absolute chaos. Don't you understand? If the government doesn't take control of everything and define everything and tell you what's right and wrong about every area, everybody's going to go berserk. Now, we call it the either-or fallacy. It is simply, there is another alternative that you might not be aware of, don't be sarcastic like I am right now, like I'm getting convicted about, because my, okay. The idea is simply this, that, well, do you realize that there's another alternative? And that means people could be self-governed from within. There's an alternative you haven't thought about. What? Freedom, liberty, under law, not anarchy. You see, the problem is the assault will often come with the assault framing the situation as if the two extremes, and you don't agree with either of them, there is another. It's called God. It's called the Bible. And that's also a danger and a warning. Don't jump on the bandwagon of extremes. Think. Think it through. And then realize that, you see, the assault on truth is going to require us to think. That's a great place for amen. It's going to require believers to think according to the word of God. That's better, okay. Because the biblical principle of jurisdiction, God did not give the civil government all power. He gave only justice to the civil government by the rule of law. And the government of the home, the government of the church, the government of towns, the government are all separate from the transcendence or, or the state or the federal government. You have separation of powers. You have separation and checks. The real question is, who should solve the problem? Not always assuming that government should solve the problem. The problem could be solved by other people. I said this. I said this one time. I was in a, in a little friendly debate. I wasn't planning on it. I was just going to dinner. And... They wanted to debate. I tried sharing that with Charlene. They wanted to. <laughs> it's not me. But they said, oh, no, there's, there's no way. I said, let me just throw this out. If company A 
pollutes the Cape Cod Canal, who's responsible? They said, well, company A, well, how come it doesn't work that way? How come the taxpayer is responsible to clean up the whole Cape Cod Canal when it was the company that, that was the dereliction of duty? Why don't we have personal responsibility? That's another alternative. But my whole point is not that you be schooled in every other point of view. The issue is simply this. Be aware that when you're assaulted, it's not you they're assaulting. It's the Lord. So calm down. I'm preaching this right to me. Calm down. And realize that it's the Lord. I just need to know what that assumption is. Another one that's very, very common, last one I'll deal with here, is, is this. Um, someone said to me, well, do you, do you believe in justice? I, I knew there was a veil in there. I said, I do, but what is your definition of justice? And they gave me the definition of social justice that's in our culture today, which is the taking of people's property and opinions and redistributing them for appeasement to whatever group is complaining and has the domination of the time period. And I said, I said, that's, I do believe in justice, but I believe in justice, the rule of law. I think justice, do you remember this monument? And they look at me, because I like monuments. Do you remember the monuments and they have the scales of justice and she's blindfolded? So it's very popular, it's in Washington, D.C., it's in many places, and she's blindfolded. In other words, justice does not care what skin color you have, justice does not care where you came from, doesn't care if you're rich or poor, does not care if uh, you've been good or bad, does not care about any of those things, it just cares about the fact that each person is going to get justice. That's why the Constitution says equal justice. And we could, I could tell right away, this is not the definition that we were dealing with. That's equivocation. The changing of the meaning of words. You all know that recession doesn't mean recession anymore. <laughs> but the point is simply this. Let's draw this to a key quote. You and I are in a war. The assault is not directed to us. It's directed to Christ, the Savior of the world, the one who saved our souls. So we can say, Lord, would you soften my heart toward the person through whom the assault comes, the institution from whom attacks it, that I would be gracious, I would be respectful, I would be civil, be careful. Most discussions will not be won on social media. In fact, social media is too convenient to throw a grenade without personally having to discuss it. My personal suggestion, I know you didn't ask, but my personal suggestion is I'd leave debate on social issues off social media. And I would let it happen personally, someone who knows who you are. That, free of charge, that's just a sideline thing. God tells us that with the renewing of the mind, when we grow up in the Lord, we will be able to see the faulty assumptions that are coming in the castle arguments us coming our way. And be able to deal with those. That is true persecution. Now, next week, we're going to talk about the real persecution that could be coming economically, physically, or any other area in our society. But the point is, you and I need to realize it starts within. You can prepare now. I can prepare now by asking God, Lord, would you ramp up my discernment, my understanding so I can deduce what assumptions I'm dealing with, and then let God Peruse it. Let's practice Selah as Victoria comes and ministers now. And as she sings, let's just ponder the Lord, who he is, and his word. And you do have the oh, Look at that. There you got it. You've got the mic. Victoria, go ahead. God bless you. Carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go.
Amen. Just before Jeff closes us in prayer, let's stand together. I want to just ask you this question. How many of you honestly wrestle with discernment in the mind when it comes to this, whether it's focus, distraction? Seriously. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray right now for you before he closes in prayer. I want you to keep your hands up, and let's just pray with God right now. So God, I pray right now. I come by the authority of the blood of Jesus. And God, I, I ask you right now, help each one to begin to rehearse Scripture, to focus on the things that they need to focus on, to, to keep their minds in limitations, Lord, to bring discernment. I pray, God, that you would move in this way. You want to cast down these strongholds, Lord. We come against the enemy that would exaggerate it, that would enhance it, that would make it far worse than it actually is. And God, in Jesus' name, we bind the works of the enemy, and we ask you, Lord, help us to think clearly and confidently knowing you are in charge and God rehearsing your word we pray God now that you would move by your power and your grace set us free Lord and help us to be able to measure the difference of resisting the assaults in Jesus name amen amen thank you Lord so let's just bow before we close this morning and just I want to be sure you're aware that we'll have people up here to pray for you after. If you have any needs, please come forward. You know, as I close this morning, I uh, think of the recent decision in, in Kansas and with the abortion ruling that they had there. And then I read something that someone wrote, and it said this, and it really spoke to me. Let's not be moved by what we see or observe, but move by what he says. That decision didn't knock Jesus off the throne. He's still on the throne. The battle belongs to the Lord. Let's continue, church, to press in to the things of God. Amen. So, Lord, we just thank you this day, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the word of truth, Lord God. The word, the truth that sets us free, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we're just so mindful of Ephesians, of the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the shield of faith. Lord, we just stand on your word this day, Lord God. For your word is true. Your word will never, ever fail. Your word is forever. So, Father, we thank you this day, Lord Jesus, as we go forth, Lord God, ambassadors into a lost and dying world, and those that you have put around us, Lord Jesus, to minister to, to love, as only the love of Christ could be given into their lives. So, Father, we bless you as we go forth this day. Give us your marching orders in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless each and every one of you.